Hey, welcome. Great. Or uh, I guess here in Dallas, Texas, we'll just say howdy to this uh, this seminar on more about AI and higher education. Uh, a little housekeeping, as you have questions during our presentation, please use the handy Q&A in the Whova, which we'll be monitoring and we'll do our best to answer each question. So let's get started. Howdy again. Uh, we know that at a glance, AI is daunting. At least it was for us, scary, humbling in many ways. And, and shouldn't seminars like this only be delivered by people who really uh, have a lot of confidence uh, in doing complex, intricate, and extraordinarily massive things with AI? Um, if you're here for that, you may be a little disappointed, but at SMU Dallas, we're here to tell our story that we've discovered a potency of simplicity. And we want to share that whatever we're doing, and we're doing some things, uh, has been much better than just talking about doing things or doing nothing. Our story is about being a university that does more than just vocalizing fear or good intentions or aspirations. If we had more money or more people, we would do things with AI. Um, we want to share our small but real actions, the experiments, and our willingness to venture into, into an unknown. Um, sometimes I think everyone underestimates the value of these ordinary things. And we, like you, we have everyday tips and tricks to share, small-scale trials, errors, successes. Uh, but bluntly, I think we're special because we have courage to embrace novelty, and we hope you do too. We're here to share some of our minute actions, and when aggregated and combined with the glue of the people on this call, the leadership here, and who are bringing people together, we've become, we really believe we're doing some things that are extraordinary. So as you journey with us today, our hope is that you leave here not only informed, but a little inspired to do more with AI. Doing anything is better than doing nothing. And we want you inspired to understand that mere talk and inaction, I think, is the only true setback to modern education and AI. And that even the simplest endeavor with AI, wherever we work, um, can lead to really cool outcomes. So let our story be a testament to you. Do not just uh, talk or think about doing things with AI. Take a step and come with us to the next AI conference and share your story instead of us next time about, to me, what's really another era of digital transformation. So let me introduce you to the glue of Southern Methodist University in Dallas, uh, Dr. Paige Ware, our Associate Provost for Faculty Success. Without her really serving as our institution, institutional glue person for AI, I think we'd be in a worse off place. But Paige, why don't you kick us off and, uh, and be the glue to this presentation also? Okay, sounds good. Thanks for that that lead in, Jason. It's always fun to work with you and have that inspired tone. Uh, my name is Paige Ware, and I serve currently as the Associate Provost for Faculty Success at SMU. I've been on faculty here for 20 years and in this role since the very beginning of COVID. From that time uh, in COVID, we had to do a lot of very fast, very top-down initiatives, at least felt very very top down. So when uh, Squirrel Eiserloch, who will introduce himself in a moment in Faculty Senate last November, mentioned this thing called Chat GPT and what plans did we have for it, my my radar went off. I'm like, Chat GPT, what is that? And since then, in the last, I'd say, 11 months, uh, we have spawned a number of faculty affinity groups and research staff affinity groups that we want to share with you because we feel like the momentum we have built at SMU that was sparked simply by a culture of curiosity and by people who like being around each other and like to ask each other candid questions um, led to what turned into a couple of dense pages full of activities and events. And so we're going to share those with you after we do a round of introductions. So Squirrel, over to you. Thanks. Um... So I'm Squirrel Iserlo. I'm a non-tenure track professor of practice. Uh, I teach in, a, in our graduate school for video game development. So I teach game programming and, and math. Uh, my areas of specialty are AI and procedural generation, but uh, that was before the advent of all this new stuff. So I'm not sure anyone's an expert in any of this uh, new frontier, but uh, I'm very excited about it and curious about it. Jennifer, oh, just, how about you? Uh, sorry, Eric, do you want to introduce yourself? Okay. Yeah, I'll go. Um, so my name's Eric Godet. I'm the team lead for research and data science um, here in our IT organization. And me and my team make it so that faculty doing research um, can do research bigger, better, and faster using 
things like generative AI, data science, high performance computing. Um, my background is as a particle physicist. And so we've been using AI for a long time, but this generative stuff is brand new. And so how do we get our researchers and, and faculty who teach in these kind of high tech fields um, to adapt it? Uh, generative AI is, is where I come in. Jennifer, you want to take it from there? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Culver. I'm the Senior Academic Technology Services Director for the Simmons School at SMU and the Manager of SMU's Online Production Services Team. In my academic technology role, I support the faculty and the staff in Simmons in their teaching, in their research, and in their other creative pursuits. So it's been part of my role to help figure out how to help faculty do whatever it is that they want to be able to do to bring this into their classroom if they want to bring it into their classroom. Uh, Eric and I both report to Jason, so I'll pass it over to him. Hey, uh, you heard from me at the beginning. Howdy again. I'm Jason Warner, the Associate Chief Information Officer for Academic Technology Computers at SMU. Um, I, I'm I'm the guy that people are always asking for more staff. We need more staff to do to do more things uh, to help faculty, or we need to buy more products, and we need to to buy more things. We have so many gaps that we always need to spend money for. And my tone is, has shifted on AI. I'm like, why don't we put AI to work solving these problems, filling these gaps for practical things having to do with accessibility or um, saving time for faculty, uh, you know, just very practical problems that we're not going to hire more people if we don't have to. We're not going to buy more products. Why don't we use AI to solve these problems institutionally? Back to you, Paige. Yeah. All right. So now the the way that our presentation or conversation is laid out is is in two parts. So first, what we'd like to do is give you a grand tour of the various initiatives, events, workshops, activities that we have inspired at SMU and that other other faculty and staff have come along with. So. After we give you that grand tour and each of us will talk about different aspects of that and give you concrete examples, um, we have another part of the session in which we will um, address some commonly held questions, assumptions, fears, challenges with AI. But we would love to get your questions along the way. So please do make use of the Whova question and answer. And Jason will be monitoring that and we will interrupt ourselves or Jason gets the, the right to interrupt us so that we can address your questions as, as we go, rather than just having us talk, 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 talk at you if, if you would rather um, just address the questions in real time. We're happy to do that. So I'm going to kick it off by talking a little bit about how this uh, the initial affinity group of 15 faculty and staff came to be. And you're looking at one third of that initial group. The five of us were on in that initial group. In early January, we came together and um, discussed how we might pull together a faculty voice around generative AI that was proactive rather than reactive. Again, we had came reeling out of COVID for some of the ways in which we had to handle emergency type situations without a whole lot of um, faculty expertise. So what we did is we decided there were four domains that we anticipated faculty affinity groups and research staff would be interested in. The first and obvious pedagogy and classroom um, use of generative AI. The second would be research related uses and abuses. Uh, the third was kind of like, what the heck is ChatGPT? We wanted to create a safe space for people who didn't really have a whole lot of background information because we saw that this was going to be coming so quickly. We wanted to provide a grounded space for that. And the fourth was policy and legal. And that fourth pillar, we were um, very, very interested in ensuring that this faculty-led initiative was going to lay any kind of groundwork for any kind of sudden decision-making around um, administrative concerns. So we thought if this group leads forward, then we are not in a reactive position, but rather in a more proactive position. Out of that initial January meeting spawned the idea of a weekly email blast called On the Horizon with Generative AI. And so every week for the entire semester, we had 15, 15 editions of this Monday morning um, 
uh, email and people could opt in to that email. So we grew from 15 original affinity group members to over 100 by the end of the semester who were receiving by request um, this email. That represents approximately one seventh of our faculty body. Um, and that email then also became a place where people could bring in their own ideas. And then I was the curator of that email for the first semester. So people would email my office. We have a special email, faculty success at smu.edu. They would email that. And then I would amplify with kind of a groomed collection of uh, curated ideas, resources, links, events, workshops. And that became the vehicle by which interested faculty and staff could feel that they were participating. Um, we carried that over with a monthly. We started trans we transitioned from weekly to monthly in June. So June, July, August, September, October. If you just a very quick screen share of what a typical email might look like, this one went out today. So it goes to a group where we are we are we talk about discussion groups for Big Bot on campus. We our undergrads received this chat GPT information. We talked about research happening at SMU around it. Ah. This very conference was um, was touted in this last email, and then we always end with some um, suggested readings. So it's not that hard to curate. It's a very informal tone, but it provides a way for people to know that there is this culture of curiosity out there. And through that, we've been able then to also glue together the various units and divisions and departments on campus so that we don't just have a bunch of folks over here talking high tech who never interact with folks over here who are more low tech. We've really brought together interdisciplinary interests through this simple common vehicle. Um, I'm going to turn it over to now Eric, who's going to talk about some of the workshop components that were threaded through um, this past semester. Eric, over to you. Sounds good. Thanks, Paige. Um, so yeah, so as ChatGPT kind of came on the scene, there was a lot of, we'll call it magical thinking around what it could do, what it couldn't do, um, whether it was a boogeyman or not. And so some of the things that that we as research support started doing is we partnered and we're in Office of Information Technology um, and our libraries. We'd always kind of done this uh, around Valentine's Day. We say love data week and we we do data related um, workshops to try to get people thinking about research data and data management and things like that. Um, so we started adding in just a, I've heard of AI, but I don't know what it's about. So an AI for non-experts type of workshop. And in that we start just very simply. Um, I, I flash a picture of a dog, a picture of a wolf, and I say, okay, what is this? And all the audience says, it's a dog. And the next one, it's a wolf. Dog, wolf, dog, wolf. And then I flash a picture of a dog in snow and everybody says dog and I say wolf. And we have this kind of disconnect of, well, you just taught me that everything on a white background is a wolf. And now this dog is on a white background, therefore must be a wolf. And it gets people thinking about, okay, this is how data is tagged and this is how data is structured. And this is the kind of core to this generative AI piece is you really have to kind of start thinking about how a computer thinks and computational thinking is not always inherent. Um, especially when, when approaching this and it's new and it's scary and it does all sorts of crazy stuff and it can rewrite, you know, Tupac lyrics into a recipe for a chocolate cake. And you think that that's magic. And then if you start thinking about, okay, there's more to it than that. Um, it's, you kind of demystify it and it becomes more accessible. And then you start thinking, oh, I actually can integrate this in my research, in my classes. I understand where my students are, are coming from when they want to use it. And it, it brings it down a level from kind of like pop science magic to a real useful tool. Um, and so that's kind of where our workshops have been. We also have some kind of more... Uh, technical workshops where you can actually train models. Um, we don't do large language models in workshops. They take way too long to train, but we can do things like handwriting recognition and some stuff like that. And so we've done some of these like zero to 60 kind of workshops. They take a couple hours 
Um, and we've had pretty good attendance, kind of building kind of a community of researchers around this uh, space. And, you know, as Paige said, kind of building that culture of curiosity is, okay, I've dabbled in this. How do I use it for my own stuff? Um, and then kind of once they've started thinking, how can I use it for my research or how can I play around with it? Then it's, how do I start using that in my classes? Are there, how are my students using it? How do I adapt to that? Um, to meet them where they are, because inevitably students are going to dabble much faster than any faculty can. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer. Thanks, Eric. In addition to that kind of workshops, the Center for Teaching Excellence also hosted some workshops beginning right away in the spring of 2023. And some of those workshops included some panel discussions that had a variety of different faculty and other people who were engaging with generative AI quickly and how they were integrating that into their pedagogy. We had a lot of people, the attendance was really high and the other nice thing about that was we saw a pretty good representation from all areas of campus. As Paige mentioned, there's going to be some discussion groups around BigBot on campus. People had the opportunity to sign up. They've been given the text if they want to be able to take part. And we're looking forward to seeing how that, how that turns out as well. In the beginning of fall, we had the Teaching Effectiveness Symposium and as part of that, we were pulled together again as a panel to talk about ChatGPT with Eric, with Jason, and to be able to answer some questions and take a look at some of the resources. And one of the resources that I created for the participants there looks like this. Main picture on this page was me asking one of the generative AI image Jennifer, creators. Wait, to... Jennifer, wait, that just looks like an ordinary LMS like like course at at any old university. I mean, most universities. It really does. It does. You're absolutely right. I put all of this into our university's Canvas learning management system. That way. I could add people to it and it would be right there on their dashboard whenever they needed it. I didn't want them to have to go to a whole new place if they were interested in any of this. The image is asking what, um, asking generative AI, what generative AI would look like if it was an anthropomorphized person. And I did several of these along the way because my background is in the humanities and I really wanted to be able to to ask it those kinds of questions. But as far as resources, what I've done is I've created some modules, one that explores the way it works, one that talks about AI as a coach, more like an instructional coach, where we apply generative AI to support teaching and learning. And one of the generative AI tools even calls itself a co-pilot. And that's what I was thinking about as I kind of put these roles up, that they're there to help you and assist you and make you more productive in all of these different ways. AI as your own assistant to enhance your own productivity, AI as an AI detector when possible. And there's also a module on critically evaluating generative AI tools because part of what I wanted to have everybody have the ability to take a look at is several different lenses for students to be able to think critically about the tools before they decide whether or not they want to incorporate what they've learned from those tools without any further investigation. And with that, I'm sending it back to Paige. Okay, great. So um, one of the one of the wonderful things about this resource that Jennifer has created is it 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 has been made available to all of our faculty to use in their in their as she said in their canvas and at the end of this session she's made it publicly available for you so she'll post a link um, for you all to also browse and use these resources to the extent that they are beneficial to you so it's a self-paced kind of exploration guide that 
is thoughtfully organized around some of the key components that faculty who are often new to AI are curious about. And instead of having to go and search for every possible manifestation, she's already created kind of a, a starter kit for them. So it's done a lot to uh, erase some of that anxiety that uh, faculty might have around AI because it's an interface that they're very comfortable with already. Um, so I think next we were going to have Jason talk a bit more about some of the other initiatives. Jason, yeah, hey, you... um, yeah, no, absolutely. wait, sorry, no, Squirrel is oh. up. Sorry, not oh. you, Jason. Oh. Squirrel, sorry, sorry, Squirrel. Sorry, Squirrel. That's fine. Um, yeah, so I think in all these discussions that the various, you know, affinity groups uh, and, and this initial group as it starts growing, um, and Paige mentioned the four areas of concern, uh, one of those, of course, was how do the professors uh, adjudicate this? How do they set policy for their own classrooms? And do we need a policy as a university? What are other universities doing or what are other professors doing in their syllabi? And so um, kind of, you know, on our, our weight on our back foot, we just started searching, you know, well, what what is everyone else doing and what is everyone else saying? And we dug up you know, 30, 40 examples of either policies or statements uh, or positional statements or uh, extracted, you know, excerpts from syllabi from other professors at our university or at other universities. <laughs> and it was absolute madness. Uh, we found everything from nothing, just complete crickets, to small, short statements uh, that were either completely... Uh, blanket statements or they were too vague to be useful to uh some i think one professor had you know a four page policy or something like that just uh, essentially a diatribe on ai um and so it was really really difficult for us to even understand what is the state of the art in terms of understanding this and in terms of you know setting policy on a classroom basis or on a university basis um and so we were trying to figure out what do we do about it? Do we have a stance as a university? How do we help our faculty, um, you know, uh, make it clear to the students what's permitted and whether it's permitted in a consistent way? And so we then kind of undertook, and this was coming out of the spring uh, in anticipation of rolling into the fall, realizing, okay, this thing has reached critical mass and we we don't have control rods into it. So, so how do we manage this and are we ready to set policy as a university and if not what can we do um and so there was a lot of discussion about that and a lot of ongoing you know uh, research and and gathering and distilling things and so um one of the things that we did i think that's been really successful is uh since we use simple syllabus uh universally through the um in canvas through all of our courses it's very easy for us uh, from an IT standpoint to add uh, optional or required sections in the digital syllabi of, of any courses. Um, we weren't ready yet to say that um, that there's a blanket boilerplate statement from the university. Um, we, we don't feel probably even now um, qualified to make such a boilerplate statement. Um, and yet we wanted to empower the faculty to, to have clear, consistent statements to their students, if nothing else. Um, and so we ended up coming up with three different statements um, that were opt-in. So each professor, when uh, she would see her syllabus for, that she's putting together for her new class, would see three new sections, and they were opt-in. So she could enable uh, one of them or none of them or, or two of them. Uh, and we had crafted three different statements that were relatively you know, straightforward, strong, but uh, not um, blind um, for what we thought were sort of the three centers of mass of uh, likely policies professors would want for towards generative AI use in their classrooms. Uh, and those were essentially, um, and we can share the, the details if, if need be, but um, one, uh, and the most commonly chosen one, I think 50% of people who opted in uh, chose the first option, which is uh, the use of generative AI is not permitted in this class, essentially. Um, and uh, and so going into a little more detail, but basically likening it to plagiarism. Um, and then there was a second option, which is that the use of generative AI is permitted in the class circumstantially, uh, but only with, uh, you know, when it's 
the context is clear and uh, always with attribution. Um, and we still don't have, you know, a university policy of what, for what's the correct way to attribute things that are generative. Um, and of course, chat GPT doesn't give attributions. So you can say, well, I got this from chat GPT, but that's a blender of a thousand sources. So that's still problematic. But um, we knew that some professors would want to do that. In fact, 18% of them opted for that uh, choice uh, that students could use it as long as they were clear about their use. Um, and that way we were regarding it more as sort of the way people use uh, an encyclopedia or um, or Google, right? Just saying, well, I found this online and here's the citation for the source. Um, we could say chat GPT type this up for me. Here's, and and I'm not claiming to have written it. I got this from chat GPT. Here was the prompt I used, that sort of thing. So as long as it was permitted use, as long as it was, as it was clear and attributed and not the student claiming that they had authored something that they hadn't. Um, and then uh, a third option, which um, is only amounted to 3% uh, of respondents uh, or of, of syllabi where they were making choices, but still amounted to 55 different courses said that, uh, yes, the generative AI was fully um, permissible within the class. And of course the class is gonna set the parameters for that. Uh, but not only is it permissible, but uh, that we're intending for you to use it and we will be um, in fact in many of those classes using it actively um, so this was a lot of those were computer science or or data science or whatever classes but i'm imagining quite a lot of other ones too i think jennifer has some uh some very interesting classes that no one knows even what school to put them in that um ai is being used for all kinds of things um that are not just um that, that are collaborative. So maybe she'll speak about that later. Um, so anyway, overall, we had a lot, uh, I'll, I'll say a surprising number of respondents. I was surprised how many faculty um, did actually re read the, the options that we had given them. Uh, and of course, it wasn't mandatory. So they could say none of those, uh, or they could say their own. Uh, we strongly encouraged them to pick one of either the A, B, C policy or D other and write their own. So that was still encouraged. Um, but what we don't want is for it to be unclear. Um, and I'll say there were four main motivations for this. Um, one, like I said, we weren't ready for the university to take a stance, but, and so a lot of this has had to be adjudicated class for class. Um, two, I think a lot of the professors, uh, especially professors who are not as close to, um, you know, tech fields, probably weren't didn't feel like they were in any position to have any idea what to write um like even understand this problem yet how are they going to adjudicate it so we we're trying to give them something that would be useful for them where they could read it and say oh yeah yeah that a is a is what i want of this thing that i kind of understand um third we we didn't want students you know from our experience of looking at other universities policies and syllabi we were flabbergasted at just the variety of language and uh, and detail. And so we were imagining scenarios where our students are going to walk in and pull up seven different syllabi and every one of them is going to be a completely different thing using terms in inconsistent ways. And they have to remember seven different bespoke policies this semester. Uh, and so that just seemed like a little too chaotic and too much of a burden to put on the students. Um, even if the professors are willing to do that, um, to offer those. Um, and then lastly, we wanted the Honors Council, you know, have some groundwork to, uh, something to rub against, really, uh, to say, well, the, the class was clear in the syllabus that you have, you know, all four of these classes said it wasn't permitted and you used it in all four classes and you didn't attribute any of those times. It's a clear violation of policy. Um, the professor and the Honors Council wouldn't really be empowered to navigate this issue at all without that sort of thing. So I, overall, I would say it, it was very, very helpful to the faculty. Uh, and, and I was pleasantly surprised at how much engagement they had to have us author, you know, as long as necessary, but no longer um, quick, simple summaries. And for the students to see that consistently that I have class, you know, four classes and three of them all have this, it's not allowed, but this fourth class says this other thing, um, so, so, so far that's been really successful. I think that's going to persist, uh, into the spring. Um, and so, uh, we can talk la later in the, 
at the end in Q&A about whether we think that'll ever be institutionalized policy. Um, but certainly for me, in terms of practice, uh, it seems like a best practice to have every syllabus say something. Uh, and to save the professors the burden of having to write it ourselves, themselves, I think it ended up being useful for this group to provide them with language um, that they could choose from. So, and most did. Um, and I guess, Jason, were you going to talk about the CTE symposium? Yes, sir. So um, back to me. I uh, I wanted to just talk about two of the things that two of our strategies that we began to employ, which is uh, one to uh, to bake AI into some things we already had regularly scheduled every year. So for a predictable, regular format to infuse some AI and also to lean on our our campus, our, our campus governance uh, committee of faculty to help us uh, be affinity partners. So in August, we have something we call the Center for Teaching of Effectiveness Teaching Symposium. Jennifer Culver mentioned it briefly, um, where we baked AI into the programming. We, the, the point was to face new things head on. And the, the whole theme of our Teaching Effectiveness Symposium this year was generative AI in the classroom. Attendance was at a record high. Um, we had approximately 30% of our faculty show up and attend the uh, half day of panels. Uh, it was one of those where, uh, I'll just be honest, I was the most professionally vulnerable I had ever felt uh, giving a presentation on, on, on generative AI. Um, I asked the group, who here has never logged into ChatGPT or any generative AI tool? And predictably, more than half of that room put their hands up and that's what was shocking to me was, uh, was again, the university should be in a place to lead in this discussion. And we as staff and faculty in these, edu in these institutions, we need to be in a place to, uh, to be the ambassadors of, of new things. Um, there's that quote, you know, you don't want to be a person who burns books without reading them. Um, I think there's a lot of that here with generative AI. And this room was full of people who were lighting torches and, and sharpening pitchforks about, you know, we want IT to eradicate uh, AI and block AI, and uh, that's not going to happen. Um, and we had to be honest in front of this group of people that, yeah, IT is here to be a partner, but you know we're we're here to support you, and we need to equip you with with a vocabulary, with a knowledge, and things to do with AI. And we need to also really um, call to action the room that, look, we can't be passive. Um, again, we can't do nothing, and we can't expect other people to solve problems for us that have to do with AI. With AI. We, we have to uh, just, just acknowledge that we at the university, the faculty, where new knowledge comes from, it was a really an opportunity in this session. Uh, faculty came wanting the, the panacea, the, the magic bullet, as it were, to AI. And we were here to tell them, well, it's to go back and familiarize yourself with at least get a free GPT account. Put your assignments in there, uh, put your test questions in, see what your students are going to do. And actually, uh, that was one of those, those sessions where many people at the beginning of the session thought we would never allow it. And by the end of the session, we saw some gradual softening of that position to say, well, maybe I can try something if I have people who will partner with me. The other thing, and that if you, you know, since you if you work in high ed, you know you you uh, you need to to lean on your faculty governance, either your faculty senate, and at SMU we have a faculty technology council that is charged with analyzing our issues and concerns. Um, we've engaged them to become a mouthpiece for generative AI uh, this term, um, and we want to uh, uh, you know they're they're vetting these these syllabus statements, but you know faculty communicating things to other faculty who then communicate things to their students is really the way to go. Um, our next charge with this group is to engage with all of the academic departments on campus. We're going to go to the department chairs um, because the department chairs want to give answers and they need the vocabulary. We're going to equip each with a toolkit, um, a script and a common vocabulary. And here's the secret sauce. Um, we're also gonna work with the department chair's administrative assistants so that they also maybe have some ideas also about uh, helping the chair navigate some of these conversations with faculty about resources and what to do around campus. So um, 
you know, it's ambitious, but starting with a faculty group that's sponsoring these initiatives kind of helps us clear the path to um, just taking steps forward. It doesn't have to be expensive new products or new service centers or new people. It's really just equipping them with ideas, a toolkit, maybe a slide presentation, just new vocabulary or try this free tool. Um, anything that helps us take a step forward, knowing that we have the backing of and the blessing of our, our combined faculty. Oh, oh, I just want to say one more thing. Uh, this is, I'm a value-based uh, statement guy. I think that all the pushback that, that the world is experiencing and the fear that faculty are experiencing in this, uh, all the pushback against uh, generative AI in education, boy, to me, that's a sign of progress. Something right is happening. Something disruptive is happening. And we're still in this, this awesome era where just doing a little bit allows us to lead this conversation and participate in days like today rather than to just kind of wait and see where things fall. So, yeah, keep doing things. I forget who's next. I'm next. I think it's you, Paige. Yes, it's me. I am the transition back into what's going to be more what we hope is Q&A so that there's a little bit more interaction. So I've been um, browsing the chat and I wanted to ping off of my summary of our of this section. I wanted to ping off some of the things that have come in because the last part of what we're doing in this in, in this last well since January. So is looking ahead, like what what's on the horizon for us now. And a lot of that is exactly what you guys are starting to point out in the chat, right? Um, so Matthew Hillier uh, wrote about setting rules being one thing, but can the but can you detect how it's being used? And the jury's out on that, right? I mean, everything I listen to and read uh, <laughs> says that you can, but then the the the, the tools are always going to be one step ahead of the detection, right? So we're always going to be trailing that. And so what we're trying to do in those kinds of situations is exactly the kind of questions that faculty are asking right now. The ones that choose option A, like Susan wrote that at her institution, most people would choose option A, like ban it, can't be used, it's plagiarism, it's cheating. I'm not so sure that that um, stance will hold up against the world outside of academia because we're seeing how much generative AI is being used in so many domains. And so we've got to find a way to, uh, I think, to help faculty think about this not as A or B or C, but as um, context dependent, assignment dependent, um, uh, pedagogical goals dependent. And so one course could have a progression of uses and abuses instead of having these blanket statements. So part of the aspirational goals for us moving forward is to learn from faculty who have bumped up against some of the conundrums and the ethical dilemmas and really try to problem solve with them. What does this look like to integrate in ways that give you the satisfaction of knowing that your students actually are learning a certain set of skills um, that you want to hold them accountable to, but then maybe they're leveraging AI to harness those skills and do something even more innovative or more cognitively complex. So we don't have the answers, nor does anyone on this call, I'm sure, but the goal for us is to engage in those those conversations and take actions in that direction rather than have this kind of shut down. So in my role, because I'm a, a, a point at which faculty come, like all complaints rise to me. Um, and uh, also by the same token, all good ideas rise up to request resources, right? So I get the best of both worlds, right? I get to take the complaints and turn them into conversations for change. And I get to take the suggestions and help promote them with resources. So part of what we're trying to do is continue the dialogue. And I know that sounds kind of trite, but the truth is I'll get these complaints from people saying, we have to purchase this detection tool because this cannot happen. And I can put that person in a conversation with a larger group. So that person sees that they're in this little echo chamber and they need to be part of a university, not in an echo chamber. And I do think that the way in which SMU has 
engaged with curiosity and used voices from all domains. So there is not, you've been hearing us talk about faculty and staff. There aren't these um, privileged spaces and privileged voices around AI that is the domain of what's my classroom, my pedagogy, my academic privilege. Of course it is, it will always be that, but that is encased in a wider world of a commitment that we are a university that explores the edges of knowledge and knowledge production and participation and preparation for a workforce that's constantly changing and an intellectual space that's constantly changing as well. So we're able to, yeah, I see that Matthew, sorry, I just jumped back into chat. The Bannett stance is already dead. Oh no, 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 not dead among the, <laughs> the, the, the typical faculty member. And I think that's part of the 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 thing that we're learning is 50% of the faculty are still saying ban it. And these faculty have a lot of privilege inside a university because they get to mandate what counts as learning, what counts as uh, the tools and resources we're allowed to learn with. So part of the goal is to help persuade, as Jason was talking about, persuade through example, persuade through breaking down fear, persuade through reality checks of what the, you know, the outside world is doing. Um, oh, different systems in different countries. Yes, that could be it too. You have to let us know, Matthew, what country you're in. So keep keep chatting over here. I want to hear more from, from you. Ah, Australia. Okay, good. My husband's Australian. So yes, I can see that. Um, anyway, so the, the, the Q&A is already starting in the chat. And we did have, just in case we didn't have questions rolling in, we uh, built using AI a slide deck to guide the question. So Jennifer is going to explain how she built it. And unless Jason tells us there are questions in the Whova, we're going to pull it up. Yes, Squirrel. I want to just throw in on on what you were just saying um, before we do into that. Go into that. I think I think this is really key to this the struggle here uh, and the, having the right framing at your university that it's not going to be like Jason led with, there is no silver bullet that's going to come either from IT or the provost office or anywhere else. Um, and and we're a long way off, if that even exists, of having any idea what it is. And so there has to be understanding uh, and participation at the faculty and staff levels and, and faculty in particular. And so what we're looking for is ways to educate, to inform, to involve, to welcome uh, the faculty into this and to help them understand uh, that, um, for example, that detection um, is fraught with false positives, and that that's um, you know the the cost of those false positives is much higher than the benefit of whatever potential detections we might have. And so, rather than focusing on detection, uh, hey, faculty member, you can focus on crafting your assignments, your um, whatever, to uh, in ways that will be a better measure and a better exercise and a better measure of uh, learning that uh, in ways that are more difficult for the students just to sort of phone into chat GPT. So how can you take this test or this assignment and restructure it in a way that it's not trivially solvable by uh, by AI? And, and we can help you understand what's the difference between a trivially solvable assignment and, and one that isn't. Um, and then also just um, understanding uh, have letting them understand, helping the faculty understand the nature of the beast. Uh, like we've said, you know, between it's it's the devil and and a magic potion, um, that that it's very powerful um, and it's very useful for a number of things, but it also um, fabricates. And and what does that mean exactly? And how do we use that? And and in what ways is it revolutionarily like the inner the advent of the internet itself, or say Wikipedia, um, and do we have to, you know, do we have learns from how we adapted to the internet and to Wikipedia um, as educational institutions in hindsight for now how we're going to adapt to this thing? Because we see it as just as big of a paradigm shift as those things. I think one of the things that you said in there that, that came up in one of the courses I was teaching, the teaching and learning with technology, this idea of changing assessments and looking at different 
ways to create those kinds of authentic assessments. One of the things that I encouraged that group of people to do, they were K-12 teachers, was to have the have them open up one of the generative AI options. I gave them several. And then I asked them to put in, I'm teaching this grade level, I'm teaching this learning outcome. Can you give to me four or five different ways that a student could demonstrate mastery of this skill or or tell me how they couldn't tell me what they know and I need to know that they know these things and it does a great job at things like that because there really isn't anything to to hallucinate or get it wrong there's that AI as the instructional coach saying here here are all these different ways you can create assessments out of certain learning objects and then pick the ones that are the best fit for the students in the room. So I think there's one of those moments where we can kind of turn it on its head and say, yes, we can look at, at assessments differently. Let's have it help us do that. The, um, the slide deck, I want to show you just very quickly. Jason, do you did, was there something in there? Yeah, we have some uh, questions. That <laughs> okay. And you can pull that up and I'll, uh, I'll ask the first question. Um, uh, did the emphasis on AI literacy for faculty this year overshadow professional development in other areas related to teaching and learning? So Paige, you want to field that question? Did the emphasis on AI overshadow? Is that what the question? Yeah. No, no. I, so the year before it connected. So the year before um, our CTE symposium, for example, was on inclusive teaching and we did workshops throughout the year on inclusive teaching. So generative AI hit the horizon around the same time as um, the middle of those the, the, the year of focus on inclusive teaching. And in fact, that is one of the ways in which faculty got really interested in generative AI because immediately you see equity differences. Immediately you see, again, the regurgitation of themes of digital divide, the usage issues in digital divide. You would have kids coming in from private schools who are leveraging AI in creative ways, kids coming out of public schools who were, you know, ban, ban, ban the AI. So already we could put together generative AI with equity. We also talked about power dynamics and how faculty have the power to deny the use of innovative approaches and to, um, Obvious, well, to uh, encourage students to engage in conversations about ethics and plagiarism and cheating, or to simply ban with no conversation at all. So we, we never, I guess at our university, because it's been such a nice kind of combination of voices, we've had a philosopher next to a computer scientist on a panel. And so it's not a reductionistic view of generative AI at all, but rather pinning it into ongoing themes about what it means to impart knowledge, what it means to assess knowledge. If, if we, you, mean, you can't get away from um, equity issues, if you have some students who are using AI exclusively and never actually master anything and just perform their way through school, that's an equity issue. Um, so they're being cheated out of their own their own learning without knowing it until it's too late. So no, I wouldn't say it's overshadowed at all, at all. If anything, it's, it's um, probably made it more interesting. That sounds a little Pollyanna, but it's kind of how it's felt this year. No, I, I, I agree, Paige. And I mentioned in the chat that, you know, we, we have kind of just made a net addition to the teaching, learning and technology type workshops that we offer. Um, we, we've, I mean, I know to some to faculty, it must seem like just one more thing they have to keep track of, but I'd rather them have it available and them not use it than to want it and us not offer it. So we are offering as much as, as we can on usual teaching and learning type topics, but, you know, AI is now another topic that we feel compelled to, to offer uh, uh, trainings and orientation on. Um, all right, another I question. I mean, I think or, I would, oh, please do. Uh, the other do question another. is what is the, the toolkit that we're talking about? Love the idea of working with administrative assistants. And Jennifer, you're going to pull up your screen again to go through some of that, yes? Or you're going to share something, I think. 
No, you're muted, I think. What we, wanted to, what we wanted to share was that one of the things that we did was think about different ways to, to look at generative AI and some of the things it can do. I went to this particular tool. It's called Dectopus. So it creates... A generative AI creates a PowerPoint presentation for you. You just tell it what it is that you want the presentation to be about. You tell it who the audience is. You tell it basically at the end of the session what it is you really want them to know. Now, we've looked at it, but we didn't make any changes to it. But So we thought we would give you a chance to take a look at it quickly and critique it with us so you can see kind of how it did. So here's the title that we gave it. It gives you a really quick intro into what it is. And it breaks it into teaching and learning, research. As you can see, I think some of the statements are kind of surface level. It does get into some of the ethical considerations implementation, kinds of challenges and obstacles, and call to action at the end. Dectopus, like some of the other ones, would let you go in and make any edits you wanted to, add any more slides that you wanted to, but if you're like me and there have been moments where you know exactly what you want to say, you just need something to kind of help you get started, this can be something that can give you a good start, whether you keep any of it or not. And it added the images, Jennifer. It, it's fully generated just from a text prompt. Yes, it added all of the images as well. That's interesting it's, because we want to empower our faculty to use this as a tool, you know, appropriately for their own prep. I'm always behind stuff and can accelerate my wordsmithing or whatever, um, giving me something to start with, or me writing something that's, I'm like, ah, it's too long. Hey, can you make a shorter version of this chat TPT, which I use all the time because I'm uh, overly uh, verbose. Um, but also there is a fine line where we want to say, again, if these are really useful tools for us to do our jobs on a daily basis, and we're training people to go out and be effective professionals to do their jobs, whatever they may be in whatever field, on a daily basis, that we can't assume that those tools aren't going to be as useful to them once they leave the school as they are to us now. And so if our job is, in fact, to train people for life as well as vocation, you know, it, we would be doing them a disservice if we said that you can't use these tools. Uh, so. And I think going back to, unless there are more questions, Jason, for us to address, going back to the other question about whether generative AI is overshadowed, I think it it reminds me of when we first had a rapid expansion of technology tools and people were asking, well, why should I use why should I use a laptop in my classroom? Like the push for a laptop in every student's hands. Like, how can technology do this better? And there were concerns about technology wasn't actually doing things better. It was just a little more efficient, little, uh, 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 but there wasn't anything additive. And so the real question was, how can technology enhance, not just replicate? And I think we're having to rethink what we assign, why we assign it, and which skills are not getting taught because we're spending a lot of time on things that are labor intensive. And if you can free up some of that labor intensity, then perhaps you can move on to other higher level skills. So there are questions every every teacher needs to be asking about fundamentally, why do you teach this, not that? And is it just because that's how you were taught to teach this, not that? And we know the power of educational systems to reproduce themselves generation after generation after generation. So for me, as a professional educator trained in education, teacher education, it's invited questions that we need to be asking regularly, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think that it just asks us to do that quickly <laughs> um, to get to the fundamentals of what we insist, like what is the role of a five paragraph essay now? 
and what could our students be doing instead of a five paragraph essay um if they yeah, in many generate... ways if 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 ai went away tomorrow we've already opened the box and we now know you know we've seen our many of our weaknesses that it's exposed in our in our teaching methods and i think there's huge value even in a non-defensive way of really streamlining and asking where is what's the the fat and what's the the muscle you know in your curriculum So I think um, we only have a few minutes left. So if there are any further questions or comments that our panelists want to provide, um, I'm happy to give my last two cents that we're enjoying this ride. And I think that it's created not just one affinity group, but many. And as Jason started out with, um, we simply said we don't want to be alone in front of our computer and our students asking these questions. We're going to create a community out of it. And we have done that in a variety of ways, some in person, some online, some through one to many communications. We just encourage you to pick that momentum up and trust that there are going to be people who will respond and resonate. Uh, maybe not everybody, but at least a hundred, at least one seventh. And Paige won't toot her own horn, but as the associate provost, I think we've all agreed it's been pivotal to have someone at, at a high level who is uh, aware, who is uh, proactive and making things happen without being dictatorial or without feeling like she has to have the answers, just making the conversations happen. I think so finding that person at your university who can be that advocate for the conversations rather than for the answers. Um, I think that's what Paige will be the first to tell you that she didn't bring the answers to the table, but she made all of the the conversations happen uh, that are producing whatever answers we do have. So I think finding that person and leaning into them at university um, is key, and we've just been lucky. So. Well, I'm lucky because I surround myself by people who are really smart and interesting. So it's fun to it's fun to lean into learning from you all. Thank you all so much for attending this session. It is close to 10 o'clock and we do need to find out how the Rangers are doing, guys. What's the score? We've got a World Series that we're trying 11 to 11 to 3. 11 to all 3. All right. All Think right. about us here in Dallas rooting on our home team. Oh, sadly, 11 to 3. We have an odd Rangers fan <laughs> out there. <laughs> Yes, when I went like this, it was because we hit a home run. Oh, okay. Um, thank you all for joining, and we will see you hopefully um, in other sessions where we're where we are the uh, not the spectators. It feels a little bit like that though, uh, where we are the listeners and you are the uh, speakers. So thank you again for joining us, and thank you to our team, Jason, Squirrel, Eric, and Jennifer for uh, coming along for this talk. Good night.